Hello, today is the 25th of August. This is the Mike Dominic Show. I am unsurprisingly Mike Dominic. I uh, got a really cool chat today. Another one of the wonderful super fan to System76 folks that I met over there in Denver. I gotta tell you, you go to Denver once and it just pays off for years. I strongly recommend it. Jay LaCroix, he does a bunch of stuff. Uh, Jay has a relatively new YouTube channel that's doing awesome called LearnLinux.tv. He's the, the author of several Linux books, uh, like legit big publisher books, including uh, Mastering Ubuntu Server. I think there's two editions of that. The third edition comes out. No one knows when, but soon, right? And he also wrote the Linux Mint Essentials book, something I've actually taken a look at years ago myself. So really great guy, very knowledgeable. He knows his stuff on Linux. If you are looking to get into being a Linux user or like learning some of the kind of Linux server administration stuff, strongly suggest you check out Jay's content, uh, check out his YouTube channel, Learn Linux TV. Uh, we have a great talk, a little bit of reminiscing about, you know, the mythical trip in Denver. I know it's, I can't, what can I say? It was a great time and I, I keep having people on from it. The show is, as always, sponsored by my consulting shop, The Mad Botter. We write Python and Ruby and sometimes C++ software if you need it. Uh, you can find them at themadbotter.com. You can find me at Dumanuku on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to delay it anymore. Here's Jay. All right. Hello, Mr. LaCroix. So uh, what brings you here? Well, just chatting about Linux because that's my favorite thing in the world. You know, the only thing that comes close is retro gaming, but Linux is always number one for me. So I love to talk about tech and actually any kind of tech. I'll talk about anything, Linux especially, but just technology in general. Love it. Awesome. And you're, you're of course, the author of a few books, right? A couple editions of Mastering Ubuntu Server. And I think you had a Linux Mint Essentials book, if I... I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was my first, actually. That was, uh, I want to say back in 2014, but I could be wrong. Um, that was a while ago. It's hard to believe that much time has passed since that book came out. Wow, that's super cool. So can you give us a uh, Ubuntu server tip for those of us who don't know? Well, uh, I guess one easy one is that when you go to install Ubuntu Server 2004, it's going to more than likely ask you to update the installer, which, you know, even if you just downloaded it, you might be thinking, why am I already updating the installer when I just downloaded it today? But often it's a um, they'll have an update because it's a live installer and definitely say yes, because it actually fixes bugs, sometimes security bugs. There is a vulnerability, I believe, in how the cryptographic password was stored. I don't quite remember the details, but definitely make sure that you say yes when it asks you if you want to update. That's a new feature in 2004. So uh, it's good to know to make sure you do that. Oh, that's a great tip. I didn't even know that. Wow. Yeah. I'm, uh, so you and I actually met a few years ago in, uh, in you're your another super fan from uh, Super Fan System 76 Salon. Yep. It was a hell of a party. Number two. That was the second one. In, Number two, right? Yeah. That was when they, they didn't even have the name Thelio yet. They, I don't think they did. They had, um, they shown us some, you know, prototypes and th that they had. And they also announced the Galago Pro at the time. That was the first aluminum laptop they ever had. And then, yeah, we caught up there. That was before they moved to the warehouse that they're at now. And that's where we met. Yeah, that was, that was, a, a, I think it might've been three years ago or two and a half. I don't remember. Yeah, something like that. It was about three years. It's funny. I have a Thaleo on my desk that I'm actually recording on right now, so... I have one as well. But, um, you know, that's interesting. You really uh, messed up by not going to the third Superfan event. They gave everybody a Thelio. Oh, damn. <laughs> Man, if you could have picked one to miss, it shouldn't have been that. You it shouldn't yeah. have been that one, yeah. You should have went to that one. So that's uh, the one so I'm actually looking at now. It, right on the front, it, it's etched in, um, has custom etching. It says designed for our Superfans on the front. Oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Now, are you running, uh, so on, on your Ubuntu servers, Mm-hmm. What do you know, if anything, about ARM? So I am running the Raspberry Pi version of Ubuntu, awesome. um, which obviously the Pi runs on ARM. Um, I also have a Pinebook Pro. I haven't tried Ubuntu on that yet. I, I'm hoping to. But um, ARM is kind of one of those things that we that some people love to love and others love to hate. There, there doesn't really there doesn't seem to be anyone in the middle, in my opinion. It's either you love it, love the idea. You hate the idea. And I'm cautiously optimistic. So I guess you could say I'm in the middle. But um, so far on the Raspberry Pi, I, I did a video on my channel recently where I was showing the process of installing Ubuntu on the Raspberry Pi with uh, eight gigs of RAM. 
the, the newest one they have, and setting up a Kubernetes cluster on it. And I'm starting to wonder if, um, you know, ARM might make a splash in the server world. I mean, it's easy for me because I just run my own servers and I'm my own IT person, but the cost savings is amazing. Like for the, I mean, it's just like a cell phone charger. It, it is a cell phone charger that powers that. And um, you can run an entire server on there, um, which is pretty amazing. And then, of course, we have the news about Apple switching to ARM. They like to call it um, Apple Silicon, which um, is the least buzzwordy term I've ever heard them come up with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really expected it to be the I processor or something. It's easier to say, you know, the Apple Silicon just doesn't roll off the tongue. And I, I have this... Um, it's a really stupid pet peeve I don't talk about where sometimes when people mispronounce things, it drives me crazy, but I never say that. But I guess when we're talking about Apple, I may as well. Like when people say OS X, it's like, no, it's it's OS X. And they switched it to Mac OS just to try to get the, you know, get people to say, stop saying um, OS X. And then now it's OS 11 to really try to get people to stop saying it. Now here they are with Apple Silicon, which some people might say Silicon. I hope nobody says Apple Silicon because that'd be even weirder. But, but, you know, there's going to be all kinds of people mispronouncing it and they'll just say, yeah, Apple processor, maybe. I don't know. But ARM is is making a splash right now. I think it's actually kind of interesting to see where things go. Yeah, it seems interesting in terms of like if running ARM servers for things like power consumption, right? If you were running a data center. Yeah, for yeah. sure. My server rack that I had until I, I built the new ones, it was pulling, I want to say, 500 to 550 watts continuous all the time. And it got to a point where I actually decided, well, you know, when I'm sleeping, I don't need to use these servers. So I just put in a cron job on each of them to shut down at like midnight. And then I hooked up a Raspberry Pi on the switch to basically do a wake on land to the servers at seven in the morning. So I'm basically just getting my coffee. I hear the servers, you know, whirring up and your fans powering on. And that certainly helped. But then when you think about Raspberry Pi, it's, it's orders of magnitude lower. There's certain things you can't do as well. But the new servers that I have now, I, I have some videos on my channel. I, I did a new free NAS storage server and a virtualization server that each run at about 50 watts or so. So my new servers, I can leave them online on all the time and it really doesn't matter so much as 150 watts for my whole server rack right now, which is wow, that's about actually- 400. Yeah, that's yeah. like savings of, of somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 watts all the time. And that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do wonder about ARM servers in terms of software and, you know, dependency and compatibility, but that almost feels like a matter of time, right? Where, uh, you know, library vendors will just, you know, make an ARM build. It doesn't really seem to be a problem for the most part. There's going to be the edge cases that you don't expect. So when I set up a Kubernetes cluster on the Pi, So basically I have four pies, one's a master and three nodes on there. And I was expecting to run into a problem. So I was expecting to go online. You know, I I was looking at instructions that admittedly were probably for x86. I figured, okay, I'm going to run through these instructions and something's going to break. Something's not going to work. And actually it, it went fine. I didn't have a single problem. Didn't have to do anything special. I'm like, that was kind of weird. That was too easy. So then I start trying to load containers and then I remembered that containers are targeted for specific platforms and they're all almost all x86. So now I have this Kubernetes cluster. Okay, what can I run on it? And then I found, um, it's actually listening to the self-hosted podcast and they mentioned, I think it was linuxserver.io if I remember correctly. And they have ARM builds of a ginormous number of containers. Like every container I've ever wanted to run are on that site. So now I have no problem running things on it. There's literally nothing I'm missing at this point. But if somebody didn't know any better, they would try to run containers and they would be like, yeah, um, I can't get anything to work. If they didn't know about that website, they might get frustrated and give up on it. And um, I'm I'm glad that I watched that podcast and knew about it. Otherwise, I may have uh, gotten frustrated too. Interesting. So... Kind of shifting a bit, you started mm-hmm. this uh, YouTube channel, LearnLinux.tv. Yep. On a high, I mean, the name is pretty pretty straightforward, but on a high level, what are your goals there? So the goals are shifting, and you know, this is fun to talk about because I don't get asked about this a lot. So as the channel grew and, and time has passed, my you know reason for doing the channel has kind of grown as well. The main number one thing behind the channel, I think, is. Um, I love Linux. It's like my favorite thing. It's like a hobby. So when I'm working on Linux servers, it's like, it's not work. It's fun. I would do it if, if even if I didn't have a job, if I was unemployed, I'd still be doing the same thing either way. And that involves a lot of studying, a lot of reading. I, I could spend hours a day reading, learning. And 
not to be morbid or, or, you know, blunt, but the fact of the matter is if I got hit by a car tomorrow, then that knowledge is gone. All that hard work, getting that knowledge is for nothing because it, you know, if I don't get that knowledge out into the world and give it to other people, um, if I do give it to other people, it's eternal. I mean, that to me is, I like to give that knowledge out. My main reason for doing that, you know, I don't talk about my day job much. We, you know, I'm in a kind of a management role. It's just really great when you empower other people or teach them something and then you see them thrive, right? You, you see someone that might be a beginner or right. someone that doesn't really understand it. And maybe I just have a, you know, at work, I might have a training session with someone or something like that. And then years down the road, you know, I, I check them out on Facebook, see what they're doing because I've moved companies and see them move up in their positions and their skill sets and everything. It's just a really great feeling. And I've always been really interested in education. I've always wanted to be a teacher. Couldn't really make that happen because the pay is just so low. It's not about the money, but you do have to pay the bills. Absolutely. So the tutorial videos and the books are kind of my way of scratching that itch because, um, and, and to be, and what's funny, when it comes to books and even the YouTube channel, the money is actually less than being a teacher, to be honest. But I go at my own pace because if I'm teaching a class, you know, uh, people expect me to be there, you know, at class time. But given my day job and everything where I work on a lot of servers and a lot of clients, I mean, um, who's to say a server's not going to go down that I need to help fix when it's time to start a class? But, you know, doing the books and the YouTube channel, if I don't have time to do a video or write a chapter, I just don't. And then I just pick it up a different day. So um, anyway, to get back on subject, the the whole point of the channel is mostly education, but it's just celebrating Linux. And I do reviews and I do some opinion videos, hardware builds, and, you know, I'll do hardware reviews. And I'll review any piece of hardware someone sends me, but only System76 is sending me things now. I've actually reached out to other vendors and it's really hard to get people to send me stuff, but I um, I do a lot of the reviews. And um, in the future, I'm not really sure what form this is going to take, but I want to create a education platform around it. It's not going to be like I'm going to charge people to watch the videos. The only thing I do now is I give people early access, but the videos are still going to be free. But at some point... I want to develop a platform around it where maybe someone can get a lab server going um, that maybe they can't afford to run a virtualization server. Their computer isn't strong enough to run VirtualBox, for example. Sure. That um, they can just um, send some a few dollars my way and you know log into a website, click a button, get a server for the videos, and then it deletes itself. I have all kinds of ideas to push this forward, but um, right now it's generally like uh, tutorials, reviews, and basically... It's a hobby. Anything I'm into at the moment, I'll do videos on it. Yeah, I saw that. I know you have a whole series on Ansible. And uh, yep. I actually was taking a look at a recent video, the one regarding, and I'm, I just have to look at the title, why we shouldn't judge Linux based on its inability to run unsupported apps. Yep. I actually thought that was pretty interesting. Do you want to dive into that a little? Yeah. So there's a few things that kind of bother me about in the Linux community. And there is, and there's another video that, that I did before this one that kind of led into that one where there's a little, there's toxicity in the Linux community. And I don't want to generalize it because there's uh, mostly good people. It's just that the toxic people are louder, right? You could have like a hundred people that are really nice and kind, but you have that one person that's not so nice and that person right. stands out. That's just the way it works. So it it's works. easy to kind of point your finger at, at the community that when it's being disrespectful. But the first video I was talking about, um, I've seen people go and ask for help on forums and they get just obliterated. They get, oh, yeah. Yeah, get no. uh, flamed. And in, in my mindset is like, you know, if you don't want to help people, then don't, right? No one's forcing you to volunteer at a forum. And if you're moody, I get it. You know, life happens. And that's a pet peeve of mine. And then getting into the video the video that you're mentioning, I look through the comments and I just see some some really bad comments toward Linux that I don't think is fair. Now I feel like if you were to tell me, you know, I tried Linux and you know it didn't really work out for me, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's fair. If someone says, you know, I my job mandates Adobe Photoshop and unless it can run that natively, it's just not something that I can use. I'm totally fine with that. I feel like you should always use the operating system or platform that one, you like, and two, get your work done. And if it's not Linux, then it's not Linux. Um, I'm not one to feel like you should use Linux and nothing else. But what that video was talking about is this mindset where people will just constantly make comments. And it's, it's so common. You'll see, well, Linux is garbage. It can't even run Photoshop. It can't even run Microsoft Word. It, it, it's like, 
wait a minute, is there a official metric somewhere online guidelines for an operating system to be good? And it, it's just this peer reviewed document that in order to, for an operating system to be good, it has to meet these requirements. I, there isn't, right? It's, it's, does it work for you or doesn't it? That's really all it comes down to. But uh, the whole pet peeve of mine is when people go against or just trash talk an entire platform just because they themselves don't like it, right? Um, I'm a vegetarian. And if I'm in a restaurant and I see people eating meat, I'm not going to say, hey, you shouldn't do that. that that's just horrible. I'm not going to judge anyone. You eat what you want. Just like when it comes to computers, use what you want. Use what you like. And I think that just really is a bad thing in the open source community because a lot of these people out there, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people that get paid to write this software. I mean, Red Hat employs quite a few, but if you think about it, there's people out there that just do this for fun. They just like to hack on code and, and create some new features and things. And, you know, if you put yourself in those people's mindsets, you know, they're the platform that they want to develop on and donate their time to is constantly being trash talked by people that, in my opinion, just don't understand how operating systems and computers work in general. And I, I don't think that's fair. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I know when I was starting with Linux years and years ago, I learned very quickly do not go to r slash Linux on Reddit and ask for like help, right? Yeah. You're just going to get ripped apart. Right. And yeah. I, it's horrible that people can treat other people that way. At the end of the day, you know, it's, it's just, I mean, it's not even just Linux. I mean, you can't even, um, I mean, how dare you like a new Star Wars movie? You know? Oh, of course. You know, if you like the new Star Wars movie, oh my God, you're a horrible fan. You should never like that movie. It's like, like when people and fan bases get to a certain point, they, they start to get toxic where people just flame each other just because, you know, they like a different episode of a movie or a different operating system. At the end of the day, it's like, you know, who cares? Use what you like and, and use what gets your work done. And it's kind of funny when people will say, you know, um, they'll make these comments. They'll say like, LibreOffice is crap. It's not even as good as Microsoft Office. You can't get your work done. And then I, then I reply, excuse me, um, I've written four books professionally published from LibreOffice. So it's not as bad as you think it is. It, it actually works. <laughs> and usually that's when that conversation breaks down. But for other people reading it, it's like they look at that and they say, oh, wow. So maybe I shouldn't try Linux because this LibreOffice is so bad, according to what people are saying. And it just kind of paints it in an unfair light. I think people just need to try it for themselves, really. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I think we're seeing, too, a lot of folks coming over from the Mac side of life, uh, such yep. as myself. Uh, but, you know, with some of the changes Apple has made. It also goes down to what you started with, too, because, hmm. I mean, a lot of people start with started with Windows. I did. But a friend of mine, you know, she she started with Linux, you know. It's interesting to see the inverse of this. And she goes over a friend's house. And this is back when those MP3 players were popular that are essentially flash drives. Um, for people that didn't want to pay for an iPod back then, you could just buy this $30 flash drive with a headphone jack. I'm sure you've probably oh, seen yeah. it. Oh, yeah, and um, her friend asked her to help uh, load it with with music. So she goes over there and she plugs it into the computer and then she calls me and she's upset. She's like, this is horrible. I Like I'm plugging in this this MP3 player and it doesn't show up. I'm like, what do you mean it doesn't show up? She's like, there's no icon for it. There isn't. I, I looked all over the desktop, all over the icons. And there, I'm like, are you on a Windows machine? She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, Windows doesn't have doesn't put an icon on the desktop, at least it didn't back then, I don't know if it does now, but it doesn't put an icon on the desktop and you plug in a, a flash drive or an MP3 player. Like you actually have to go to my computer after you click the start button and you'll find it in there. She's like, oh my God, this is the worst, most horrible thing I've ever seen. Who thought this was a good idea? <laughs> and she starts ranting about Windows and how um, it handles and I'm flash drives and I'm sitting there kind of snickering and laughing to myself. I'm like, this is interesting. This is kind of seeing the exact opposite of you know, the inverse of everything, you know, the other people's mindsets when they start with Windows, right? Sometimes it just goes down to what you're used to. And sometimes that can make people really frustrated when there's simple changes and they can't do a simple task. So I'm, I'm in a similar boat to your friend. I'm very uncomfortable in Windows. I don't tend to work in Windows a lot. Um, yeah. But I've had almost the opposite experience where, you know, coming from Mac, I can actually run more software on Linux, right? Particularly things like games or development mm -hmm. tools. You know, just like the Mac gaming story is is a joke. I mean, it's it really unless is. you like World of Warcraft a lot. I tried to run Diablo three on a Mac once. I don't know how long ago that was, a year or two ago. And um, you know, I don't really feel Diablo three is that graphically intensive. And at the no. time, it was the latest Mac, and I, I wouldn't think you need high power to run a game like that. And and the fan would nuts. And the thing was like a thousand degrees. Like I couldn't even touch the frame. And I'm thinking to myself like. 
Diablo 3, really? Now, to be fair, it could have just not been optimized very well by the developers. I have no idea why it was like that, but it was like that, and it was just not something I was able to, to really do. Yeah, it's gaming is definitely not a huge priority on, on Mac OS for Apple, right? It's you know, right. a totally different story on the iPad, but anyway, I'm digressing. So what yeah. would you say to someone? Let's, let's make up an imaginary person here, right? Someone mm-hmm. in a boot camp or in college, let's, let's yeah. call her Sally, I don't know. Let's say Sally wants to learn more about Linux. You know, she's trying to get a development job, but you know, these days you have to know how to spin up a server, right? You have to know how to do a little bit of DevOps. Mm-hmm. How should this person get started with the community? So the first thing I would say is anytime you want to get into a new job or get into the, a certain market, what I tell people is look for job ads that are doing the thing that you want to be doing. Not not an entry level one. Like like picture yourself ten years from now. Let's just say. Fast forward where you are in the job role that you want to get to. Look at the job ads for that job role and look at the bullet points of the requirements for that job. That's what you need to learn, right? So if you want to be a Linux systems administrator, then and that's what you want to become, then you look for jobs in that. Not like you're going to apply to any, but you're looking at what the employers are all looking for and look at a bunch of them and you'll find things that are in common that they're looking for. And AWS, for example, could be a very common one. So uh, maybe if it's cloud, you want to get into that, then you know you know you probably need to learn AWS, Google Cloud, and things like that. If you want to get more into the physical infrastructure, I mean, it kind of depends on when you say spinning up a Linux server. I mean, there's so many different ways of doing that, right? You could do it in VirtualBox. You can install it on a spare desktop if you have one. You can actually get a um, an old server, and these old servers on eBay. You know, for $150, I mean, you can get a 64 gig of RAM server for $150 with with like 24 cores or something like that. You can get a major system. Obviously, it's going to be very power hungry, so you don't want to leave it on all the time. If you want something to start on physically, then that's a great way to go. Or you could just go on to, you know, AWS. But that's really hard because you have to watch the build. I'm not going to get into that. So there's multiple ways of doing it. So if you just want to do it from a server perspective or you just want to get a development environment, there's multiple ways. I mean, you can even install Docker and just install an Ubuntu container in Docker. You're learning Docker right away uh, just by doing that. And then inside the Docker container, you can actually build a dev environment. You can put your libraries in there and you have a container that can do all your development and containers are going to run better. So I would just tell that individual, just first of all, look at the job ads, because that's going to give you a lot of information about what people are looking for and what types of things you have to learn. And then when it comes to getting started on actually installing Linux, just uh, take a look in your closet or your basement for anything old, like old computers, even an old laptop. And a lot of people don't think of this. And and I can't take credit for this because I can't remember the individual who um, said this on another podcast. But if you have an old laptop, you have a server. It has a battery, so it's a built-in UPS already. The power usage is low. And maybe that laptop is too old for games and, and things, but it's certainly good enough for installing dev tools on and using it as a server for sure. So those are that's some random tip. ideas, yeah. Yeah, that's a great tip regarding the laptop. Huh? Yeah, because that's not going to break your power bill like a Power Edge server would because, you know, yeah. um, and that's not a problem everywhere, but if you're living in Hawaii or something like that, I mean, that that could really cost you to run something like that. So just keep in mind the power usage if it is something that you should be concerned about in your area. No, that's an, that's an amazing tip and definitely good steps to take. So, Jay, I always wrap with two questions. One mm-hmm. is easy, one is hard. Which one would you like first? Hard. All right, the hard one. What should I have asked you that I either didn't know enough to ask you or just simply failed to ask you? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So there, there's all kinds of things you could have asked. I mean, um, the only other thing, maybe, you know, how, did, how the YouTube channel actually started or how I started, I guess, would be a couple things that could be asked if uh, you think it's of value to your audience. Okay, yeah, let's let's go how you started. That sounds like it'd be interesting. So this is an interesting thing because this kind of surprises some people. I didn't actually have a computer of my own until I was 19. So let that sink in for a minute. Wow. That's really late. And I grew up extremely poor. So having a computer in the house was just really not a possibility. It's just... And Even if so, having internet and being able to pay for internet was not going to be something that could happen. So it's kind of like I've always, I've always loved computers. I've always, I mean, I just see people looking at them, using them. Um, I see them in schools or, and I have very limited, you know, even living in poor areas, even the schools don't really have computers either. So I would, and I think the first 
time I started messing around with the computers was in the ninth grade and it was just a DOS computer and we just had to type, you know, basically you're taking a typing class and we just have to just copy what's on a printed piece of paper onto the screen, essentially is all it was. But I've always had this fascination with it. And then it's like I knew, I, for some reason I knew, it's like, this is what I want to do. But getting such a late start kind of made it hard, right? Because I mean, not having a computer till 19. I mean, nowadays people have computers like like when they're born, I mean, their family already has a computer in the house. Um, it, they're everywhere. But for me, it, yeah, I grew up in Flint, Michigan and the poor areas. It wasn't like that. It was kind of tough, actually. But for me, I think arrogance was and, and being stubborn is what got me started because my mentality is I'm going to do the thing I want to do. And I have people constantly tell me like, this isn't, you're not cut out for this. Just, just do something else, literally, um, repeatedly. And I'm like, meh, whatever you think, dude, or do that, whoever it is. And it's just like, I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing that. I'm this is, I'm going to do a thing. And you know, people would write me off because of where I grew up, but it's like, eh, you know what, either you support me or you don't, but I'm going to do what I need to do. And this is, this is the industry I want to work in. And then the YouTube channel, it's kind of interesting how that started because it was a complete accident. If you, if you were to ask me, you know, before then, if I was going to be on YouTube, I'd say, eh, probably not. But I also, I think I kind of alluded to it at the beginning of the call. I, I'm into retro gaming. It's just one of my other hobbies. And I don't have a YouTube channel about that because there's so many people that do that better than I would be able to do it. But one day, you know, I just made this emulator PC and this was before we had RetroPie. I just had this old Dell computer. I, I manually set it up. I, I was running like Myth, I think Myth TV, Myth Buntu. And I hand coded the XML menus, spent like weeks on this thing. And I made an emulator PC that you could control with the remote. And I saw, you know, people, you know, like uh, Linux videos. So maybe I'll just put this up there. And I was kind of inspired because I was taking Java classes and having a tough time learning it. And I think it was the new Boston was the YouTube channel. I don't even know if it still exists, but it helped me get through the class because it just t taught me Java. I had to learn it for college. And then um, I was so impressed with it that I figured, hey, maybe I'll show off my emulator PC on the, on a YouTube channel. And then people seemed to like it. Like, well, how did you do it? I'm like, well, okay, I guess I'll do another video, show you guys how I did it. And then they seemed to like that. I'm like, well, you know, those Java videos are sure fun. Maybe I'll just do some Linux videos. I've been studying Linux since 2002, may as well. And then one thing led to another and I just kept doing videos and it's just something I kind of fell into on accident. Same with the book, you know, they, my first book, they publisher reached out to me because of the YouTube channel. So I kind of feel bad because of all the people out there trying to get a publishing contract and how hard that is to get. And it was just given to me, <laughs> which um, is really good luck, but there's still a lot of people out there that would really benefit from having luck like that, I guess. Wow, that that all sounds awesome. And yes, your books are, uh, especially the Ubuntu server ones. I will when the new edition comes out, I will be reading that for sure. I can't uh, wait. I'm I'm having a lot of fun writing it. I think I'm I'm about to start the 16th chapter today, and then a handful more to go, and then it's going to go through the you know the error checking and technical review process. That's coming, and that's always a fun time. But oof. I'm really looking forward to it, though. I, I think it's um, I think it's going to be great. It sounds, it sounds amazing. So the easy question. Yeah. Super easy. What is your daily driver workstation? I would say it's my Thelio most of the time. I think the pandemic kind of made that the case because I, I love laptops the most. And if you were to ask me that question most of the time, I would probably say my mood changes every day because I have several, I have several laptops. And the reason is sure. because I just don't ever sell them. I did sell a bunch and I actually got the new Oryx Pro. So that's my current uh, new hotness. But I also love the, um, you know, pretty much all the laptops I have. I have, see, I have the Gazelle, I have the Oryx Pro, and I have the Lemur Pro, uh, the newest versions of those. So, yeah, I would, I'd have to say the Thelio, though, because being home all the time, the pandemic kind of makes that the case. I would normally just go to, like, cafes or diners or something and try to work yeah, out the same way. house. But I'm glued to my Thelio all the time, and now I'm editing videos and things, and I'm just using that, you know, most of the time. Awesome. Yeah, I'm the exact same way. I was uh, basically, at the time, a darter. Now I'm running the, uh, the lemur. But now that we're stuck at home, yeah, it's the Thelio basically full time. Yeah, it's a great machine. I, I feel like it's it's kind of funny because I was 
saving up my money from the YouTube channel and I was actually going to look into paying somebody to do that does woodworking to build me a custom PC case. I just thought it'd be so cool. And not something I want to sell, just something, you know, like you, you have a, like a musician that has a custom microphone stand or something. Sure. I wanted a custom ATX case. And then right after that, you know, you and I were there at the um, Super Fanny event, the second one, and like, oh, wow, System 76 is doing it. So I guess I don't have to, I guess I'll just buy a computer when it's time because they're at this, they already have the idea. It's kind of funny. Um, it's pretty much the direction I was going to go, but not like that because there's is so much better than what I would have been able to do. But it's kind of funny that they have like, what looks like a piece of art on your desk is what I was going for. And that's exactly what it is. It reminds me of those old, uh, you know, like the, Z- the old Zenith TVs, right? From way back when that were like a piece of, you know, yeah, like a centerpiece for the house. Or the Atari 2600 even. It had that wood there green part on there, um, you know, to, to throw in some retro gaming again. But it, it does kind of have that retro, you know, 70s, 80s kind of, feel to it because it's a piece of art i think that works because you know mid-century modern furniture is making a comeback right now antique stores are having trouble keeping some of this older furniture in stock and um, it's kind of funny what's old is new again right and now this is right and it stands out i really like their desktops because you know they're they're very well designed the apple desktops I, i i just don't they don't really impress me to be honest i mean some of them look pretty cool but this looks cool and it's more functional in my opinion, not to, you know, knock on people that like, you know, Max and, and things because I know it works for a lot of people. But for me, you know, I, I feel like I have a Linux machine that's given the Mac treatment, which is something I've been waiting for for years because my first laptop that ever shipped with Linux was the old Dell before the XPS developer edition was even a thing. They did an experiment where they had some Inspiron laptops they shipped with Ubuntu. And I had a little issue with it. I had to call them up and they're like, yeah, okay, well, click on the start button. I'm like, no, this this laptop ship with Ubuntu. What's Ubuntu? I'm like, are you looking at the, the screen of what I ordered? It doesn't have Windows. <laughs> and Dell is great now, but it feels like finally with System76, we, we get something where we're a first-class citizen and not something that uh, disrupts warranties. Yeah, yeah. I, I got one of the first Dell Sputniks and had a very similar experience with support <laughs> so. oh really i was hoping that that would would be different because mine was before that so i thought i was hoping they would have fixed it by then at, at the time you had to re- get routed to the uh to the business support line not the consumer line even even if you bought it as a consumer for reasons of i guess staffing right yeah yeah i guess yeah. um i guess that does make sense it's kind of hard when you have a really big company and you know some people they will point out the fact that a lot of System76 machines are, you know, rebranded and, and things, which isn't totally false, but they do custom BIOS. And I think being a small company is great because I saw on Twitter, it was another YouTuber who was complaining that a laptop from another company was not running as fast as the Lemur Pro. And he said, hey, I've, and he, he tagged them in this. And he's like, hey, I, I noticed that this other laptop has the exact same CPU, but the Lemur Pro is is um, benchmarking was slower and then they looked into it and just based off that one tweet and they put out a fix for it and it was it was done just like that um and that's just not something you i think you would get from a big company because they can't keep up with that yeah they really do a, a good job i mean i love my thalio and my uh i always phrase it the lemur i have the, the new little the new small ultra book the, the lemur pro the one that has the crazy battery light battery life on yeah it. that's the one yep, yep. yeah I'm, that's what i'm looking at right now in front of me actually yeah, that's an awesome machine. All right, Jay. Well, it was great chatting with you, and uh, I'll put a link to all your stuff and uh, Ubuntu Server Third Edition. Yeah, Third Edition. Yeah, no, no publication date yet, but at some point, I would say in the next one to three weeks, depending on the timing, I'll I'll have some pre-order information on my channel whenever that's released. It's actually supposed to be, I thought, put on their website this week. I think it might be delayed, but we'll see. Um, hopefully it'll it'll be on the website this week. If you Google the third edition of Mastering Ubuntu Server, as of the time we're recording this, you won't find it. It won't even come up until they put it on their site, but hopefully this week. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for coming on, man. Awesome. Nice catching up with you. Nice catching up.